And welcome to CBMC's English Worship Service. Psalm 66, 8 reads, Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. So even in our homes, let's make sure our worship is heard now. You are here.
who you are. That is who you are. That is who you
God is around the grave. Our God is around the grave. Your name, your name is victory. Announcements are at en.cbmcla.org slash bulletin, and we're right in the middle of the 40-day Bible reading plan. You can see it on our website at en.cbmcla.org slash read. And if you've already missed a few days, don't give up, and don't tell yourself that you can't do this. Keep going, and what you want to do is start with that day's reading. You can always catch up later when you have the chance. And get this, by Easter, Let's say even if you missed half of the plan, my guess is you still would have read more than if you didn't do the reading plan at all. And that would be a massive gain. Let's read this aloud as we start the sermon. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we open up your word now, we pray you would speak to us, that your word is living and active, and may it be so in our lives too. As we study this, we pray that this word would capture our thoughts and it would be with us throughout the course of this week. May we use the scriptures to better understand you and to better understand ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of my research focuses on how people tend to get stuck in particular ways of thinking and what enables them to get unstuck. Allison Ledgerwood is a psychology professor at UC Davis. I get to study how humans think and how we could maybe think better. Her research team brought two groups of people into the lab and told them about a new surgical procedure. Group one was told that the procedure has a 70% success rate. For group two, they framed it as a 30% failure rate. It's the same exact procedure and they're giving you the exact same information, but one doctor is focusing on the part of the glass that's full and the other doctor is focusing on the part of the glass that's empty. So, no surprise, people like the procedure when it's described in positive terms and they don't like it when you focus on the failure rate. But then, the researchers pointed it out to the first group that you could also think of the procedure as failing 30% of the time. Suddenly, people didn't like it anymore. And when they tried a similar thing with group two, pointing out that the procedure had a 70% success rate, people didn't change their mind. And over and over again in studies like that, we find that people seem to get stuck in the negative way of thinking about it. And it's hard for them to flip and focus on the positive. So once you frame something negatively, it really sticks. Researchers call this negativity bias. When there's negative information, our brains light up with electrical activity. Negative news lights up more than good news or even neutral news. And this is why we remember painful memories more than we remember good ones. This is why my dad always saw the negative in 
me than the positive. This is why the news gets higher ratings with fear than with encouragement. And why are we this way? Researchers will say it's because of our evolution. When our ancestors had to survive in the wild that this negativity helped them survive. I think it makes way more sense that the cause is actually the curse of sin. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind of the flesh is on death. You see, we live in a broken world. Thus, we live with a broken mind. The scriptures today are going to give us some very colorful advice. Paul of Tarsus had a reputation, perhaps a passive-aggressive one. At times, Paul comes across as assertive, you might read it and you might even think it's aggressive. Maybe you wouldn't like him as your pastor. Who knows? But you can see what the Corinthians thought right here. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1. I, Paul, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. In person, he was passive. In his writings, he was aggressive. Drop down to verse 10. And here's what else they had to say about him. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Paul needed to defend himself from their accusations. The church needed correction. And thus, Paul wrote in verse 2, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Now, we're not sure exactly what the accusation against Paul was. They said he was walking according to the flesh. Uh, what does that mean? We don't really know. We don't have any additional information. But look at the next few verses. And we're going to answer the question, how does Paul show boldness to his accusers? Now, we can apply this passage to our minds whenever we find our minds accusing us. And our theme verse, Isaiah 35, 4, Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come and save you. And if you haven't placed your trust in Jesus Christ yet, he offers you a renewed spirit, a renewed mind, if you make Jesus as Lord. Those of us with anxiety, look at these next steps as your personal action plan when your mind starts accusing you. And you're definitely going to want to balance today's passage with the rest of all of Scripture. So here we go. First step in being bold against your accusers. Number one. Use spiritual weapons to destroy spiritual strongholds. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Whatever accusation some had against Paul, he wasn't interested in being bold in the flesh. You see, Christians show boldness and wage war differently. Our weapons are different. They're spiritual weapons with divine power. Now, what weapons is he talking about? And they're not outlined here, but weapons like the scriptures, which is the sword of the spirit. We have prayer. We have thanksgiving that we talked about. We have worship, knowledge of God. These aren't weapons to most people, but in the hands of the Lord of hosts, these weapons take down strongholds. You see, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God does war differently. Look in the past. God said to Israel, I want you to go. I want you to march around the city one time and repeat this for six days straight. Um, okay, Lord. Then God said on the seventh day, march seven times around the city. Blow trumpets. The city is yours to take. And the word for stronghold is the word fortress, like this Roman fortress in Caesarea. Symbolically, anything set up against the Lord is a stronghold. So any lie, any heresy, even some negative thoughts, and the causes of the strongholds, it actually says some of them could be spiritual forces. Take a look at this verse, Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of, of evil in the heavenly places. Those of us struggling with anxiety have a spiritual worry. That's a stronghold. 
those of us struggling with past guilt and we can't receive God's mercy, that's a stronghold. Those of us struggling with negative self-talk and these reminders, that's a stronghold. Those of us struggling to forgive because we have reoccurring pains, uh, memories of pain, that's a stronghold. And those of us struggling with the thought that nothing will ever change, that we are the way we are, that too is a stronghold. This is not simply negativity bias or your brain wired for negativity. This is a spiritual battle for your mind and the stronghold is being built up. So when it comes to anxiety, we must war against it like a spiritual battle. The language that's going to follow will correspond with three different stages of ancient siege warfare against a walled city, a stronghold, or even a fortress. You're gonna see destroy, capture, punish, now the first step is to use spiritual weapons. Let's look at the next step. Destroy arguments against God. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. In ancient war, the advantage went to the offense, not to the defense. If you had siege weapons like battering rams to destroy fortresses, you'd win. Then there were very few ways to effectively break through the defensive walls of cities. So to win a siege, the attacking force needed something powerful to smash through the masonry or the thick wooden gates. Essentially, and at their simplest, they were huge logs that were suspended on ropes so they could be swung back to generate enough momentum to swing forward and exert a huge force on the target. Because of their weight, stone and wooden structures are weak in tension, so applying a sideways force on them would at first cause cracks that could then be exploited to cause the walls to crumble. Consequently, if there's a spiritual stronghold in our mind, we destroy them. We don't let them remain. We don't live with these strongholds. We destroy. But this is important, and you have to understand this. We don't destroy people. The enemy is the argument. The word here in Greek is logismos, related to the word logos, or word. So the enemy is not the person, it is the logical fallacy. The enemy is the thought. The enemy is the lofty opinions. Uh, it's symbolized by the city wall or this stronghold or fortress. And when these negative thoughts and spiritual strongholds stand against the knowledge of God, we destroy them with siege-like weapons. We out think the arguments with divine power. We find superior ways to outmatch the lofty opinions. We fill our thoughts with that which is stronger than the stronghold. We don't get defensive, we get offensive. Nobody with anxious thoughts ever says it naturally goes away. Anxious people overcome by learning new ways to control their mind, which leads us to the next step and take every thought captive to obey Christ. After the fortress and stronghold is destroyed, the enemy became captives. And what is captured? Again, it's not people, it's the thoughts. So even thoughts that are in disobedience to Christ will be made obedient to Christ. Our anxious thoughts need to be taken captive. Why do thoughts need to obey Christ? And the scriptures allude that not all thoughts are neutral. So here's something interesting, 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that we could not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. And that word designs is the same word as the thoughts. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in their case, the God of this world, Satan again, has blinded the minds or the thoughts of the unbelievers. And we've seen this verse earlier, Philippians 4.7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds or your thoughts in Christ Jesus. See, the spiritual battleground between Jesus and the devil is also in our minds which is why anxious thoughts need to be taken captive. Strongholds need to be taken down because the one who is stronger than the stronghold is here. So now the last step in showing boldness. Verse six, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Again, crucial that you don't apply this incorrectly. Again, the action plan is intended for the spiritual realm, not the flesh. So do not use this verse to punish people. You are not God's avenger, all right? Instead, we are to punish disobedience in the spiritual realm. 
Specifically, we punish thoughts and arguments against God. And the question is, well, how do we punish thoughts and arguments? How do we punish spiritual forces of Satan if that's what the stronghold is? And I don't think we do this literally. To me, it's a continuation of the battle metaphor. First, we destroy. Second, we take captive. Third, we punish. I think this is more of an attitude to battle every disobedience rather than the literal punishment. You understand. The point is that when you spiritually aren't willing to destroy, capture, or punish, evil doesn't go away. The worrying gets louder. The lies sound more like truth. The strongholds only get stronger. And some of you are playing defense with your negative thoughts rather than what the scriptures are telling in playing offense. Now, there's a religion that actually proposes a defensive posture in dealing with your mind. And that religion would be Buddhism. According to the religion, the Buddha sat under a tree and became enlightened as he was warding off these thoughts. And therefore, Buddhists believe that meditation, and you meditate on nothing, and that's what brings about peace. Well, for the vast majority of people, they can't do it. They struggle with turning off their minds. How do you get mindfulness with a mind that's always thinking? You see, our schools are implementing these practices to our students right now. Audrey's middle school has what's called Wellness Wednesdays. She's supposed to meditate and focus on her breathing technique. The students I talk to about Wellness Wednesdays, they say it doesn't work. They say it's stupid. No one is doing it because the breathing doesn't help. Thinking about nothing in front of Zoom doesn't help. You see, Buddhism is about emptying your mind. Christianity offers a different alternative. Christianity is about filling your mind while emptying your will. This is Gary Zimak. He is a Catholic author on anxiety, and he said, take it from someone who has struggled with anxiety for the better part of 50 years. It is possible to break free from worry. I am living proof. He says, the solution is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said this was kind of strange for him as a Catholic. He believed that a personal relationship with Jesus, that was a Protestant thing. That wasn't a Catholic thing. The secret is to remain close to Jesus. Daily prayer, Bible reading, and Mass have enabled me to grow closer to him than ever. And that relationship has also given me the greatest sense of peace that I've ever experienced. His solution is activities that cause him to relate to Jesus. So he talks to Jesus, he listens to Jesus, and he walks with Jesus. And even though a personal relationship with Jesus is a Protestant thing, look around. Not all Protestants have this personal relationship with Jesus. So when his anxiety is overactive, he says, one of the most effective remedies can be found in one simple Bible verse. And I recommend you read it at least once daily and repeat as needed. It's a reminder that no matter what happens in the world, God is still in charge. So here's what you can do. When you find that your mind is going negative, once you realize it, and it could be a while before you figure that out, capture that negative thought by writing it down in a sentence. Some people keep things like anxiety journals. I'm going to write down, I feel like I'm no good and that I'm a fraud. What you're actually doing is you're transforming a vague thought into words and arguments as described by today's passage. And sometimes you see the logical fallacy of the thought once it's down on paper. Or maybe you do your phone, doesn't matter. But the next step is to replace the thought with scripture. Ephesians 6.16 says, Extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word or the word rhema of God, praying at all times in the spirit. Now, the interesting thing here is that Greek has two words for the word word. You already know one, that's logos, and that's the generic word for word. The word here is the word rhema, which means a spoken word. The instruction is to speak God's word, well, not just read it, not just think about it. Something spiritual happens when God's word is spoken. So now I'm going to memorize a verse and I'm going to say it out loud. Maybe you say it aloud as you write it down in that journal. As an example, I'm going to choose Isaiah 43.1. 
Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Maybe you want to memorize Isaiah 35, 4. That be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come and save you. And so my negative thoughts aren't going to go away immediately. Whenever it comes back, I'll recite Isaiah 43, 1 again. And again. And again. Maybe I'll sing a song. Maybe I'll pray aloud. Whatever I do, I won't just sit defensively and hope that it goes away. This is how you destroy, how you capture, and how you punish one thought at a time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would take captive every thought. You would help us to control our minds, that by the renewal of our mind, we would be able to discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and acceptable. Jesus, we want to love you with all of our mind. And that means that if strongholds exist there that are incompatible with the gospel, with who you are, may we destroy them. May you help remove any lie that we have believed in, any stronghold that holds power over us. We pray that we would know your scripture so much that we would fill our minds with your word, that we would be able to speak it out loud as often as needed. Jesus, may you help us to be bold and may you help us to control our minds. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Favor and promise.
received, I will sow. Let's conclude with speaking God's word aloud for our benediction. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Well, blessings to you this weekend. Stay safe and healthy.